Go Gators. Yes, indeed. Uh, Dr. Bechtel, welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Thank, um, super excited to talk to everyone today about bladder cancers and prostate cancers and what we can do. Um, and is it okay if I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, how, how does everything look on your end? Can you see my slides? Yeah, it looks great. Excellent. Okay. So I'll get my spotlight set up here and um, I will get started. Okay. So cancer of the urinary bladder and prostate um, can be a little bit difficult for us to figure out, mainly because there's no real palpable mass that we can find on physical exam or um, symptoms of these types of cancers are also consistent with lots of other diseases that we'll talk about today. Um, and sometimes when we find them, our, our goal mainly is going to be quality of life. So how can we keep our patients feeling comfortable for as long as possible. And so what I have for you all here today is a lateral abdominal radiograph of a male dog diagnosed with prostate cancer. His urinary bladder is right here, and then his prostate is mineralized, just caudal to the bladder. This was a young castrated male dog, or sorry, old castrated male dog, castrated when he was young. Um, and so that mineralization is very consistent with a prostate cancer. So I always like to start with a case because I'm going to be honest, it's Friday afternoon and that's more interesting. And none of you guys are here to be, I, I don't know, I like the term lecture because it sounds so boring. <laughs> and I, I really am interested in them and what it is that we're talking about. And I love sharing cases and, and case information with you. So we'll start with our, our prototypical breed here. I, I do love Scottish Terriers. So we have a 12-year-old female spay Scottish Terrier, and she is presenting for multiple urinary tract infections. So you already probably know where we're going to go with this one. She has had three urinary tract infections in the last five months. Um, these have been treated empirically, not because her referring veterinarian wanted to treat them empirically, but because the clients had um, declined any further diagnostics. And I'm sure you've all experienced those clients who have dogs or cats that are high risk breeds for particular types of cancer get real, real annoyed with you when you mention that this is what we might be dealing with and we should look further. So I, we certainly even face that on the specialty side. Um, so we had recommended urine culture and abdominal imaging, and it was documented in the record that this had been recommended, and the client had declined it at the times of the first, second, and the third urinary tract infection. And so as an oncologist, I find it very easy to get tunnel vision. Um, it's super easy to think everybody, everything is going to be due to cancer, or this is an old Scottish Terrier, of course, is transitional cell carcinoma. And so to try and train myself out of that, and I'll be honest, it's a struggle. I've been doing this for many years and I still, um, I advise my students to do it and they see me do it as well, even though I've been doing this for a while and um, I write my problem list in differentials. And so in this Scottish Terrier, our problem list is mainly multiple urinary tract infections. And so our differentials for that are gonna fall into two main categories, recurrent or refractory. So for our recurrent urinary tract infections, this could be due to failure to eliminate any predisposing causes. And that can include things like perivulvar hooding and dermatitis, a systemic illness like diabetes mellitus or hyperadrenal corticism that can help predispose to multiple urinary tract infections, or even multiple pathogens where our empirical therapy will treat one pathogen. And that's why we see an improvement in clinical signs, but not all of them. So when therapy is discontinued, um, we'll see a recurrence of those clinical signs. But we also may be dealing with a refractory urinary tract infection. Um, and that could be due to inappropriate antibiotic use, which is certainly possible because we're not basing our treatment on culture because we were not permitted to do culture. So the clients tied our hands. Um, we could have a predisposing cause, and that can include um, something as simple as uroliths. And then because we have not been permitted to investigate the abdomen with imaging, um, we may not know that a urolith is there. Um, or, of course, neoplasia could be a, a concern. And as we have not been allowed to examine the bladder yet with imaging, um, there could be something hiding there, and we just don't know about it yet versus a deep-seated infection, um, including things like pyelonephritis or prostatitis, I apologize for my spelling error, um, or drug-resistant pathogen, which to me are super scary. So what now? 
Now we have this, this Scottish Terrier who's older, who's had three urinary tract infections, um, where we have not been allowed to, to do further diagnostics. And you know, at the time of referral, by the time they come to me, I'm going to be completely honest, they're usually ready to do more. Um, in primary practice, we can only explain to them the importance of these diagnostics. Um, and we always have to remember that the cost of things can sometimes be limiting for our clients. And teaching students to prioritize their diagnostics based on the problem is important. So if I had to pick, you said, Sandra, you have one diagnostic you, you can pick. This is the only one you can do. Um, I would start with a urine culture because I'd be really afraid of what we're going to be growing there. Um, in this case, um, and I, I, again, recognizing where I'm at, um, we were able to do a urinalysis, urine culture, and abdominal ultrasound in addition to a complete blood count chemistry panel to rule out some of those metabolic causes of recurrent infections. Um, her urine specific gravity was 1040, and there's the three plus proteinuria. Um, but we found the reason for proteinuria on her urine sediment. So not surprisingly, we found hematuria, pyuria, and bacteria. So lots of inflammation in blood and even bacteria within the urine sediment. And we also did a urine culture. And we did this urine culture by clipping and cleaning and taking her outside with a sterile cup and getting a midstream free catch. This is not the ideal way to get a urine culture. And I, I say that and I know it, but that's how we did it. It's an older Scotty. <laughs> I'm worried about transitional cell carcinoma. And even knowing that that's not the ideal way to get culture, I worried about doing a cystocentesis and potentially causing some seeding of a transitional cell carcinoma through the abdominal wall. Um, so I kind of hedged my bets on this one and, and did what um, I thought was best in, in, at that time for this patient. So going back to urine collection, um, seeding of the abdominal wall is something we talk about a lot in the oncology world. It is important to know that the overall risk of seeding with one cystocentesis is actually fairly low. So the percentages of how often we see abdominal seeding in dogs with TCC following cystocentesis it makes it overall pretty darn uncommon. However, when it happens, the prognosis for that dog is quite a bit poor compared to dogs that don't have abdominal seeding. I mean, that's because an abdominal wall seeding carcinoma is much harder for me to treat. They don't, it doesn't respond as well to therapy. So overall, I, I avoid it when possible, acknowledging that it is not always possible. And in one study, they looked at it all of the dogs with transitional cell carcinoma at a specialty center. And of those dogs, 4.4% had abdominal involvement. And certainly they didn't have how many of them had gotten cystocentesis. Um, but that's, a, that's overall fairly low. And we don't always know what caused it. So there are some dogs that had abdominal wall seeding with no history of cystocentesis. So it's possible that the tumor itself might just travel through the lymphatics and seed into the abdominal wall. Um, Certainly, we've had dogs who have had cystotomies to look for um, uroliths, and then a bladder mass was found, and then we have found seeding. Um, so we do recommend that if that happens to you, that you treat everything as if it's contaminated and change your instruments out and, so, and things like that um, once you're done doing what you need to do with the bladder, um, or it could absolutely be caused by cystocentesis. Um, so for urine collection in these dogs, we actually recommend either a clean midstream free catch versus urinary catheterization. Um, so catheterization gives us the benefit of not going through the abdominal wall, but still being able to collect um, a good clean sample for urine culture. Um, and it's also good, I mean, going off on a little bit of a tangent here from our case, um, but what's also nice about urinary catheterization is that it does offer us the opportunity to monitor the response to whichever therapy we are using and monitor it, monitor it effectively. Um, so I've lost my spotlight and I apologize. I'm not sure why I can't get it back. Can you see my arrow? Yeah, I see it down at the, uh, I see it down at the bottom. It's not where it was. Underneath drug resistant pathogen. Okay. Actually, um, okay, so are, are you still seeing the slide with problem list and differentials? Yes. 
Okay, I apologize. I actually moved on a couple of slides. Let me double check my screen share. Is my screen moving now? Oh, yep, it jumped ahead to the uh, to the diagnostic slide. Okay, I, I apologize for that. Um, gosh, I've been using Zoom long enough. You think I wouldn't have these issues anymore? Oh, no. um, so... it, happens. it happens to the best of us. <laughs> Um, so when we looked at this, these are the diagnostic uh, diagnostics on this kiddo, and um, this is an example of a. This is this is actually from Cruz. This is a full urinary catheter, um, and you can see the balloon here. And this gives us the opportunity to collect urine sterilely and cleanly. It also gives us the opportunity to monitor. So now what I'm saying will make a lot more sense than if I were just talking without these pictures. So here is an example of a dog who has transitional cell carcinoma. Um, and he came in for an abdominal ultrasound. He is being treated and we wanted to monitor his response to treatment. So prior to going to ultrasound, these dogs do tend to urinate more frequently. So we don't often have a full bladder. You can see here is where the urine is and right here is the bladder. And it's really hard um, to see a whole lot because the bladder mucosa is really crunched together. And so one of the issues we have is that when the bladder is less full and the tissue can look thicker. And when the bladder is distended, the tissue can look thinner and tumor smaller. And so depending on how full that bladder is, we may get different measurements. And it can be difficult for us to say, is this true tumor progression or response versus just distension of the bladder? So in dogs who are amenable to catheterization, we often will go ahead and place the Foley catheter. So here is the same dog, but you can actually see the tip of the Foley catheter here. And we distend with the bladder with saline. So we actually empty the bladder and then redistend it with the same amount of saline for every single ultrasound. Um, and then I think it's um, much easier to measure the thickness of the bladder walls because the bladder is distended the same amount every time, um, in addition to seeing the urinary bladder mass. And so when we place urinary catheters, we are often dealing with dogs that have chronic urinary tract disease. So it is important that we are sterile with our urinary catheter placement. And um, so my lovely nurses were kind enough to allow me to photograph them um, with this particular patient. So here you can see our sterile gloves and we have an extra pair of gloves just in case we accidentally contaminate ourselves. Um, all of our supplies, here's our Foley catheter. We, we do actually really like the, um, the Cruise Foley catheters. They're super easy to place. Um, and here we are placing the urinary catheter in a male dog. So the um, the nurse that is assisting with the protrusion of the penis is wearing gloves to stay clean, while the nurse that is placing the urinary catheter is wearing sterile gloves. So if we jump back to our Scotty, um, you can see that when we did the abdominal ultrasound, there is an incredibly large bladder mass right here. Um, so here's the wall of the bladder. This black area represents urine, and this right here represents a very large bladder mass. So now we can see pretty easily why our Scottish Terrier had some um, hematuria and plaqueuria and dysuria, because her bladder can't um, fill with urine the way that it needs to, so her bladder always feels very full. So when we see the in ultrasound findings such as this, um, be it just super thickened bladder wall versus an actual bladder mass, depending on the breed, transitional cell carcinoma is gonna be high on our list of differentials. Um, it is the most common of the bladder tumors versus other tumor types that are out there. But what's important to note is that chronic cystitis on imaging can look a lot like cancer. And we have been fooled on imaging between chronic cystitis and cancer. Um, there have been a couple of times where we've been pretty darn convinced and that a dog had transitional cell carcinoma, but when the infection was appropriately treated, um, the mass effect actually resolved and the thickness of the bladder resolved. And so it's very important to us to have a definitive diagnosis before recommending um, aggressive therapy for transitional cell carcinoma, because one is chemotherapy, which we don't want to suppress the immune system if there's already a secondary infection going on. I certainly don't want to give treatment to a dog that doesn't need it. Other less likely causes could be polyploid or granulomatous cystitis, fibroepithelial polyps, um, a gossy pyboma, so a, a foreign body left in there after surgery, and hopefully you would have information on whether or not that pet has had surgery before, such as a cystotomy that would indicate that a foreign body would be a possibility. Um, calculi can cause some the same clinical signs. Um, it can absolutely cause thickness in the bladder wall and symptoms 
similar to chronic cystitis, and that's where imaging can help us out, or an inflammatory pseudotumor. So this is a Scottish Terrier, and I don't like to be a breedist, but sometimes I'm a breedist. And so transitional cell carcinoma is going to be on the top of my list, and actually any older Scottish Terrier presenting with urinary signs. And it is the most common malignant bladder tumor that we diagnose. This picture here represents a cystoscopy um, picture of a bladder mass, and you can see it's almost papillary in nature. So transitional cell carcinoma tends to occur in the trigone of the bladder or close to the bladder neck. So that means that we often see urinary tract signs early. Um, and that's because the bladder feels full. It's more difficult for them to empty. And we also worry about urethral obstruction in these kiddos. It can also, but it can occur anywhere in the bladder, not just the trigone, just most commonly in the trigone. We also will often see a thickened bladder wall, and we can see those papillary lesions that I, saw, I showed you in the last slide. Over half of dogs with transitional cell carcinoma will also have involvement of the urethra. And so it's important that we discuss with owners what to look for in regards to urinary obstruction and it being a medical emergency because the urethra can is often involved. And about 29% of male dogs will have prostate involvement. Um, and so that kind of gets into the similar issue that we run into with urethral involvement and that we worry about urethral obstruction and the medical emergency associated with that. Now, most of the time at presentation, so we have an aggressive, locally aggressive tumor. It invades into the bladder wall um, and invades into the urethra. Only about 16% of dogs will actually have evidence of metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. So most of the time, these dogs will stage clean. If they have evidence of metastatic disease, that's a game changer for prognosis. So it's important that we know if it's there. But about half of dogs will have evidence of metastatic disease at the time of death. So what this, this tells me is that the disease is highly metastatic, but also that local disease control is one of the biggest and hardest things that we have to help these dogs feel better. Because once we have obstruction of the urethra and they can't urinate or the ureters and they go into renal failure, we actually are not losing them due to cancer movement, we're losing them due to the local disease itself. So here's an example with this ultrasound. Can, how can we differentiate between cystitis and cancer? So if we look at this ultrasound, it's even hard to tell where the, the urine actually is because it's um, so thick and so full of debris. And to be totally honest, I cannot tell you if this is cystitis or cancer. I, I honestly don't know. Um, and so we have some new tests that can help us differentiate these things. But in the old days, um, we would actually need to aggressively treat infection before we could potentially get our diagnosis. So for diagnosis of transitional cell carcinoma, this is one of the more exciting things that have, has come out in the past few years in, in oncology. Um, typically in the past, I'm probably going to age myself here, um, we would diagnose it based often on cytology. So um, based on a urinalysis, you may be able to do a urine sediment. And if you have no evidence of urinary tract infection, but you do have evidence of shedding cancer cells that look really scary, that was enough for a diagnosis. The problem that we had is that oftentimes a bladder mass will predispose to a urinary tract infection. And that inflammation can make shedding cells look really scary and malignant, even though they may not be cancerous. So in a dog with chronic cystitis, we would see these transitional cells with characteristics of malignancy, but there wasn't necessarily cancer there because there's secondary inflammation and infection causing changes in the cells that made them look like cancer. So if there's secondary infection or inflammation that hindered our ability to get a, a good diagnosis just based on the urine sediment or cytology. Another thing that I thankfully do not have to do much anymore of is what we call the diagnostic or traumatic catheterization. And that's where we passed a urinary catheter into the bladder and using sometimes ultrasound guidance, we could we would empty the bladder, see when the tip of our 
urinary catheter would actually touch the mass and then aggressively pull back to try and get a bunch of cells out and smear that out for cytology and get a diagnosis. Um, this was less expensive and less invasive than cystoscopy and, and could be very effective for getting a diagnosis. Keeping in mind though, that if um, there was a severe infection, we could, the inflammation would interfere with our ability to interpret that cytology. And so in some cases, we would have to move to cystoscopy to get a diagnosis um, with a forceps biopsy. So we'd actually have to get a chunk of tissue and look at that architecture to tell us what it was that we're dealing with. However, more recently, and this, this for me is super exciting, um, there is actually a urine test that is very sensitive and specific for transitional cell carcinoma. And why that excites me is because it is not invasive at all. And in the end can save a lot of money for our clients and procedures for our patients that they may not need. And um, so hopefully you all have heard of the BRAF test. Um, so BRAF is a gene and there was this, I'm sorry, go ahead. Is there a question? Okay. So BRAF is a gene, and there's a study that looked at histopathology samples of transitional cell carcinomas and carcinomas of the prostate and found that in these samples, most of these, of these tumors actually had a mutation in the BRAF gene that, they, that could be detected. So the group took it one step further and thought, well, if I can find it in the histopathology samples, maybe I can find the mutation in all of these cells that are being shed in the urine. And sure enough, they did. Um, and so what that means and why that's so exciting is that inflammation will not cause this genetic mutation. So you can have chronic cystitis and inflammation and infection, but if the mutation is there, that is due to cancer. So you don't get that interference with secondary inflammation. It's super exciting. Um, and it also means that we're not doing diagnostic catheterizations or cystoscopies on as many dogs. So we're able to give clients answers um, with a non-invasive test and you know, certainly our patients appreciate it. So what this group found was that in 83% of urine samples, they were able to, to detect with this test um, transitional cell carcinoma in 83% of dogs. Also incredibly important is that their control dogs involved dogs with cystitis and healthy dogs. And none of the dogs with cystitis and none of the normal dogs express this mutation, only dogs with transitional cell carcinoma. So that means that we can be confident that if the mutation is there, so is the cancer. It also means that we can get some false negatives. So a negative BRAF test does not mean no cancer but a positive BRAF means that there, there is transitional cell carcinoma. That is a slam dunk diagnosis. Um, so for me, that's great. It's an easy way for me to get a very confident diagnosis and then discuss therapy with clients. And it doesn't need to be through a specialist. It's actually run through Antec. Um, so this opens the door for primary veterinarians to actually get this diagnosis and either assist clients in the decision-making process, or if they do want referral, what we already have the diagnosis and we can get started on treatment much quicker because we don't have to wait to do the more advanced diagnostics. Important tips for this test. It does need 40 mils of urine. Most breeds with transitional cell carcinoma are small and they're urinating small amounts very frequently. So not a test that you're likely gonna be able to collect in a day um, at the veterinary clinic. This means that clients get to help us out. So we're not the only ones chasing dogs around with a little collection cup in the backyard. <laughs> um, what's really nice about it is we do ask them to collect it in one cup and actually pour it into the test cup because it has a preservative in it and, and it can sit at room temperature. Um, and so if they do it first thing every morning, it may take a couple of days for them to get the full 40 mils, um, but it is doable and most of our clients will be able to do it. Um, we also want the free catch sample because the act of voiding helps push some of those cells out. And so it increases the cellularity of your sample. Um, it is less ideal to use a catheterized sample um, for this particular test. So when might we want to consider advanced diagnostics? So I generally don't hold in memorizing breed predispositions to cancer. Because regardless, if you have a dog that's limping, you're probably going to recommend an x-ray. If you have a dog with enlarged lymph nodes, regardless of its risk for lymphoma, you're going to want to take a sample of those lymph nodes. So I, I generally don't worry about them too much. But for transitional cell carcinoma, this is one where I think knowing the breed is actually helpful. Because you may not have 
any external palpable signs on your physical exam that something is there that needs to be investigated. So when we look at risk factors, certainly obesity is, is a risk factor. Um, cyclophosphamide chemotherapy, we know that it's metabolite irritates the bladder. So if they're on chronic cyclophosphamide, that may increase their risk of developing transitional cell carcinoma. Females are at greater risk than males. Castrated males are at greater risk than intact males. Um, and then the breed predisposition. So our poster children are the Scottish Terrier, Shelties, Beagles, Wired-Haired Fox Terriers, and West Highland White Terriers. Um, so in these dogs, I start talking, or I would start talking to clients about looking at the bladder at the first or second incidence of a urinary tract infection. Um, also, a herbicide, an herbicide with insecticide exposure has been shown to increase the risk of transitional cell carcinoma, so certainly we want to reduce that exposure as much as possible. And then to decrease the risk of transitional cell carcinoma, I like to talk to clients about this one because um, Scotties that eat their vegetables three times a week, and specifically cruciferous vegetables, had a lower risk of developing transitional cell carcinoma than Scotties terriers that did not eat their vegetables. Um, so I actually, my daughter is six, um, and I talked to her about how important vegetables are, and she's not really a fan of broccoli. Um, but I do mention to her that it can be super healthy for dogs too. So um, it's a good way to, to keep dogs lean and make owners feel like they are doing something to contribute to their dog's health, because they are. And transitional cell beha um, carcinoma behavior, we already mentioned that they're very locally invasive, but also what's important to know about them is that we have what's called the, the concept of field carcinogenesis. And that means that whatever the whole bladder was exposed to that allowed the genetic mutation for cancer to form, the whole bladder was exposed to, not just one part of the bladder. And this is important in that every once in a while, we will get a case of transitional cell carcinoma where the mass is super small and we just happen to find it because we're ultrasounding for other reasons. Ultrasound of the belly because of elevated liver enzymes and then there's a bladder mass too, oh no. So we may be tempted to take that dog to surgery and that, that's not necessarily wrong, but even if you are able to completely excise the tumor, you have not cured that dog of transitional cell carcinoma because we will see it pop up in a different spot later on down the road, weeks to months later, there'll be another bladder mass that's cell cell carcinoma. So what that means is taking out a mass is not going to cure it in, in regards to transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. This, so the local invasion of this disease makes it does make it difficult to treat in that local disease control is important for the quality of life of our pet. Um, so in quality of life is the most important factor when I'm talking to clients about different kinds of therapy that we might have available from the very simple to the very complex, um, from the cheap to the expensive to everything in between. The quality of life is the most important. And if I cannot provide a comfortable way for my patient to urinate, then I'm not providing quality of life and we need to revisit what it is that we're doing. Um, it's also highly metastatic. Um, and so sometimes there are rare cases where we might find the metastatic disease before we actually find the primary tumor. So this was, a, this was actually a report in which you can see on CT scan the bone invasion of this tumor. Um, so here's the CT and here's the tumor um, a necropsy. And so transitional cell carcinomas do have a predilection from bone metastasis as do prostate carcinomas, mammary carcinomas, and apocrine gland anal sac adenocarcinomas. Um, and that's important in that if you have a bone lesion in the diaphyseal region of long bone, you probably want to start looking for another tumor type that may have moved there. So this is my favorite table and it's primary metastatic routes by cancer type. So this is how I teach students to think about cancer. Oftentimes we'll have a dog and they say, I'm coming in for evaluation of a sarcoma, but they actually have a mast cell tumor. Um, and so this is my chart on how not to get stressed when we're talking about staging. Um, so we have the tumor cell type, so we can lump most sarcomas into one group. They like to move through the hematogenous and the blood vessel route. And that means they like to go to lungs first, typically, there's always an exception for cancer. And for staging, we'll typically recommend chest x-rays. When we look at our round cell tumors, there'll be lymphoma, mast cell tumor, transmissible venereal tumor, plasma cell tumor. 
those typically move through the lymphatic route. And that means the first place I'm looking is gonna be the local regional lymph nodes. I may also wanna look at the lymph nodes in the chest and in the abdomen and the liver and spleen. So staging may range from as simple to a lymph node finding the aspirate to as complex as chest x-rays and ultrasound with aspirates, depending on the cancer type and how it behaves. And then we have the group of carcinomas. And I lump them with melanomas and histiocytic sarcomas because they all can move through both the hematogenous and the lymphatic route. That means we can see metastasis to lungs, local regional lymph nodes, which would be like the lymph nodes in the sublumbar region, um, lymph nodes of the chest, abdomen, liver, spleen. And that means we like to look at chest x-rays, lymph node, re, re, local regional lymph node aspirates, um, and ultrasound with fine needle aspirates, keeping in mind that there is a predilection for bone metastasis in this tumor type. Dr. Bechtel? Yes. Um, so quick questions from the audience. Um, for the, I think, uh, Brianna, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the BRAF test, uh, are those free catch samples or are they catheterized samples or does it matter? Does it affect how we interpret the diagnostics? Oh, uh, yes. So the BRAF sample should be collected by free catch. That's a test that we send home with clients because we need 40 mils of urine. And most of the breeds that have transitional cell carcinoma are fairly small, and they're also urinating small amounts frequently. Um, so we send it home with the clients, and they can collect in one cup and then actually pass it. The test cup has, has a preservative in it. So they can just keep adding urine over, the, over multiple days and then send that in. Good. That's so there's the reason for that is that it is easier to collect it that way because oftentimes you're not going to get 40 mils of urine um, in a TCC dog because their bladder is full of tumor. Um, but also just the act of voiding the urine increases the number of cells in the sample and is more likely to make it diagnostic. So we don't submit catheterized or cystocentesis samples. It's a free catch. Okay, that, and that leads nicely into the next question, which was the, um, should there be a time limit on urine collection and refrigeration throughout the collection process? And so I, I think you, you spoke to that just a moment ago, but can you elaborate that a little bit? Absolutely. So the urine actually doesn't need to be refrigerated. Um, and that's because there is a preservative in the cup that you will be provided with for urine collection. So the reason we want clients to use a different cup is because we don't want the preservative to spill out. Um, and so we have them keep the collection cup sep the collection cup separate from the test cup. And so when they go outside to collect urine, we ask them to collect in that one and then gently pour it into the cup with the preservative in it. And because it has the preservative, it does not need to be refrigerated. Perfect, thanks. Thanks. Great questions. Um, so what kind of therapies do we have for transitional cell carcinoma? So once we have that diagnosis, what are we going to do about it? And so one of my jobs as an oncologist is not to offer only the Cadillac of care, but to offer all sorts of care, because in a way, I consider my job to be the easy job. And I say this because I'm also a pet owner and a total hot mess whenever one of my pets is sick. I can't think like a vet at all. It's, it's actually kind of obnoxious. Um, so it is my job to talk to clients and offer treatment options that are available that I think are appropriate for their pet. I mean, there are some times there where things may not be appropriate based on concurrent diseases or you know how the pet handles coming into the hospital. But the client has the difficult job of deciding which treatment to pick. And that is hard. And I say that having been on the other side. I mean, clients actually ask me all the time, what would you do? And my honest answer is I, I don't know because when I'm sitting in your chair and one of my colleagues is talking to me about it, I don't think like a, an oncologist, I think like a pet owner. Um, and so some of those decisions might be based on the pet's temperament. Like, are they okay coming in frequently for treatment or are they miserable when they come in? So if they're miserable, we don't want to do that to them. Um, or are they happy? Like some dogs are super happy. We give them a treat. They love us. We're super best buds. Um, and we get, you know, we give them hugs and kisses and love and, and they're perfectly fine coming in. Um, what about the client's schedule? So do they live two hours away from their nearest oncologist? And so coming in every day for radiation therapy, not super feasible for them, or are they like me and they work here and it'd be super easy to bring their pet in. And then also financials. 
Um, so unfortunately, uh, thankfully, pet insurance is getting more popular, but unfortunately, how much things cost is going to play a big factor in, in what people decide to do. And so my job, I, I might be aging myself again here, but I sometimes practice what we call MacGyver medicine. So what options do I have that gives a pet owner um, some wiggle room so that they can still do something to improve their pet's quality of life, um, but something that fits with their family goals. And it, and it is not my place to judge what a family's goals might be. So I have the least aggressive to the most aggressive options. And so for transitional cell carcinoma, I think at a bare minimum, we should always use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. These drugs are great for transitional cell carcinomas. The best studied of them is Paroxicam. I have a little picture of Paroxicam for you here. Um, that is one that has an overall about 20% response rate with Paroxicam alone for carcinomas in general, which is great. Um, so that is a drug that if it can be well tolerated um, is something that we will continue long-term. It will not affect diagnostics. So if um, let's say the dog is really uncomfortable and because their bladder is inflamed and it hurts and there's a secondary infection, you can start a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and yet still go ahead and collect for a BRAF test at the same time. It's not gonna interfere with our ability to diagnose the cancer. The only thing that's gonna maybe affect our ability to use non-steroidals will be current status of the kidneys and the gastrointestinal tract and whether or not it can tolerate paroxicam. So sometimes we may need to reduce the dose, we may need to go to every other day, or we might need to switch to a different non anti-inflammatory that is not as well studied as paroxicam, but might be a little bit easier on the kidneys, um, such as daricoxib or ferricoxib. If we wanna go a step further, we know this is a highly metastatic tumor and we know that we wanna treat locally as aggressive as possible. And as you can see here with this thickened papillary bladder wall mass um, could get uncomfortable if it gets big, we can add in chemotherapy. And there is not one chemotherapy of choice to start with first. We use mitoxantrone, carboplatin, or vinblastine. And we'll pick one. When it stops working, we'll move on to the next. When it stops working, we'll move on to the next. We can also use radiation therapy. So there, we do have some clients who want to be as aggressive as possible, and radiation therapy can really help stabilize and then shrink that mass, although we still recommend chemotherapy to further consolidate the bladder mass and then also delay the onset of metastatic disease. Then we have the question of surgery. Should we or shouldn't we do surgery? That is a great question. Um, for most masses, like the one we see here, surgery is not possible. Um, there's no way for us to take out the measurable mass and then have a dog that's continent um, in, in the long run. So most of these cases, because of location in the trigone and, and the thickness of the bladder being involved, surgery is not an option. There are some cases in which surgery is an option and the studies that have looked at these dogs um, where they've been able to remove the mass have shown that they have a good prognosis overall compared to those that don't have surgery. The problem is in those dogs getting surgery or we're selecting for ones that are gonna do better because they have smaller masses that are not the trigone. So it's hard for us to say that surgery helped those dogs versus they would have done well anyway because of the size and location of their masses. So the honest answer is I, I honestly just don't know um, whether or not surgery is helpful for them. What's interesting about transitional cell carcinoma, and this is it's kind of cool because it works in our pet's favor. Most cancers that we talk about, when it becomes resistant or progressive in the face of our chemotherapy. We talk about the next drug having a lower response rate and uh, the duration of that response being shorter. So for example, for lymphoma, so if you have a dog with high-grade lymphoma, we treat with chemotherapy, comes out of remission, we have to try something new. We generally say that the response rate drops by half and the duration drops by half with each new drug that we try. And transitional cell carcinoma is not that way. Super interesting. So there is actually a study that looked was looking at vinblastine and paroxicam. And so this is the median survival time. We love median survival times. And what that means for us is where half of dogs are still alive and half of dogs have already died due to their cancer. Um, and we use the median instead of the average 
because we have smaller numbers of patients in veterinary studies compared to human medicine. So one outlier, so one dog that gets hit by a car and dies two days after treatment might make the average quite a bit lower, whereas one dog that is a miracle dog and you know lives forever might make an average seem longer and give clients expectations that we can't meet. So we use medians. And so that means it's the middle of the road where half of dogs are alive and it's, it's less likely to be skewed uh, by those things. And so here on the vertical axis, we have the percent of dogs alive. And at the start of study, all of them are alive. And here on the horizontal axis, we have days. And so if we look at where 50% of dogs are alive, when they got vinblastine and paroxicam started at the same time, and we can see that their median survival time, sorry, and the median survival time was maybe about a little bit less than a year. But if we look at dogs that received vinblastine first, then received paroxicam, their median survival time was well over 500 days. And this we see true with different chemotherapy protocols as well. So we have found that in dogs that get sequential chemotherapy, they are just as likely to respond to the next chemotherapy as they were to the first, which means that we can keep these guys feeling good for a really long time without having the same um, hesitation that we might if we're looking at the second or third protocol for lymphoma. For transitional cell cell carcinoma, we say, yeah, let's start the next drug, let's go for it, because they're just as likely to respond that time around. So if we go back to our Scotty, and I know that I digressed quite a bit um, as we were talking about diagnostics and monitoring and therapy, um, this dog did have a resistant urinary tract infection. And as an oncologist, this to me is super scary because I want to treat them with chemotherapy, which is going to suppress the immune system. And I do not want sepsis from a resistant bug because I will lose that patient. So dogs with bladder tumors are susceptible to secondary infection. And I just wanted to remind everybody that that by definition, if there's a urinary tract infection in a dog with a bladder tumor, that is by definition a complicated urinary tract infection. And what that means is we need to treat based on culture and sensitivity, and we also need to treat for four to six weeks. So your typical duration for empirical therapy does not apply once we have a dog with a transitional cell carcinoma. Um, we have cases of MRSA, they're incredibly difficult to treat. And then we have dogs that are urinating, they may have it on themselves or in the house, and we have clients exposed to MRSA, and it's, it's just a terrible situation. Um, so we want to really avoid resistant infections when at all possible and be as aggressive as we possibly can. So I do check a, a culture about seven to 10 days after starting appropriate antibiotic therapy, and then again, seven to 10 days after completion of therapy to make sure the urinary tract infection is cleared. Um, resistant urinary tract infections can be life-limiting in these patients and, and actually fairly devastating. And so in this kiddo, we did start in non steroidal anti-inflammatories. There's no reason not to start those. Um, and we treated with appropriate antibiotic therapy. Once this urinary tract infection was controlled, so in this dog, um, I had the seven to 10 day culture. And if that was negative, I continued the antibiotics, but then felt more comfortable starting chemotherapy. And these clients also elected radiation therapy. And those dogs can live for quite a long time. So the prognosis for dogs with um, transitional cell carcinoma is quite variable when we talk about overall survival times. But the longest lived patients are those that have had multiple sequential therapy. So when one chemotherapy fails, we go ahead and start the next one. It's very stage dependent, and it's also dependent on where the mass is infiltrating in the bladder. So those dogs that have a lot of urethral involvement, if we don't have local disease control, we may lose them sooner than those dogs that have, say, a tumor in the apex, and I have more time um, to try and get control with chemotherapy. Overall, response rates are about 30-ish percent. If we talk about, then regardless of which chemotherapy protocol we talk about, um, and that is a complete remission or a partial remission. But what's also important to know is that if the patient has a good quality of life, even stable disease for me can be treatment success. So if I have a mass that's stable in size, I'm not going to change my chemotherapy yet. I'm going to need it to be progressive. Median survival times are reported out to 12 months or even longer. And radiation therapy can assist with local control in those clients that are interested in moving forward with that. Uh, we have two, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Oh yeah, sorry. So two questions about uh, insides that have come in, and so they're they're kind of they're they're supportive of each other. So let's let's talk them. Um, so the the first one was, or the second one, going first. Uh, for dogs that do not tolerate paroxicam, what's your next choice? And that fits with the previous question, which was, um, is there an optimum you know dosage? And, and trying to get at uh, some dogs don't tolerate NSAIDs well. Would you do a lower lower dosage of paroxicam versus switching to something else? So can can you get into the weeds a little bit on that? Absolutely. Um, so paroxicam is my favorite. I mean, it's a non-selective, um, so it doesn't select between COX-1 and COX-2 inhibition, which also means that it has an increased risk of toxicity to the kidneys and the GI tract. And so the dose that we use is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram with food once every 24 hours. And if that is not tolerated well, we have two options. The first is to go to every other day instead of daily. I tend to use this option more if I'm monitoring azotemia um, and, and I just want the kidneys to have a day of blood flow. If there's GI toxicity with paroxicam, I will provide a washout, usually of about five to seven days, and I'll switch to either furacoxib or diracoxib. I don't have a preference for one and I can't tell you one is better than the other, just whichever is best tolerated. Um, and if those aren't tolerated well and it's because of the kidneys, I'll, I will go to every other day again I and mean, continue monitoring that closely. If it's gastrointestinal toxicity, we could try a lower dose, um, but I'm going to be concerned mostly about quality of life. Um, so it's great if we can have that non steroidal on board, but if it's not tolerated and they're not feeling good because of it, then I'm not going to want to continue on it. So it is all about quality of life. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so some notes for clients. Um, so I found that I had to be very explicit when discussing this with clients. They need to go outside with their dog at least once a day and make sure that they're urinating. Um, I can't stress this enough. There's nothing more horrifying than hearing that one of your patients died and that the client had noticed that they weren't urinating, like they're straining to urinate with no urine, but didn't call or bring their pet in. I, that's, it's heartbreaking. So um, I am very explicit at saying that if they are trying to urinate and there's no strain, that's an emergency. That's not something that can wait. Um, there are some things that we can do to alleviate that obstruction. One of those is if it's available in your area, laser ablation, just to debulk it. So you're not really treating the tumor, you're just removing enough of it so that they can have a good urine stream again. Another option is urethral stent. And that's what I have here for you. So here is, um, it's a dog. You can see the prostate tumor, actually. This is a contrast urethrogram. And this is a picture of the stent placement. And the urethral stent is essentially a self-expanding net that just pushes tumor out of the way. So it doesn't kill any tumor cells. It doesn't really treat the tumor. It just allows your patient to urinate. That unfortunately is super expensive. Um, so at least here at UF, we look at probably three to $4,000 for placement of a urethral stent. Um, and so for some clients, they may wanna move forward with it and then have definitive tumor treatment. For some clients, that's enough to stop. In the short-term emergency, it is appropriate to place a urinary catheter, um, but it's not appropriate to have a urinary catheter indwelling for long periods of time. Um, and that's due to both comfort and also you're holding the urethra open and putting them at higher risk for infection because bacteria can track up the urinary catheter. Um, so that's one of the, the, also the things that we have to discuss with clients is regardless of what they're willing to do, if we can't alleviate the obstruction to provide quality of life, then we need to have an end of life discussion. So I'm just going to quickly, I want to talk to you about um, prostate cancer real quick. This was one of my favorite patients from a long time ago. Um, super handsome boy, 10-year-old male castrated Nova Scotia duck pulling retriever with a two-week history of strangeria. No other history of health problems, castrated at a young age, super spoiled and wonderful, and just the best dog ever. Okay. On physical exam, he was tense on abdominal palpation. And on rectal exam, just to discuss how important the rectal exam actually is, in dogs with transitional cell carcinoma, sometimes you can actually palpate a mass within the urethra. Um, and in male dogs, you can sometimes palpate in a large prostate or in large lumbar lymph nodes. So rectal is a really important part of a general physical exam. It also gives you the opportunity to feel the anal glands and make sure that there is no evidence of impaction, infection, inflammation, or um, neoplasia there. We did find a firm irregular prostate and he was very painful. Um, he had pyurea on his urinalysis. 
So we decided to do a prostatic wash and abdominal ultrasound. And this is his prostate. It's not super well delineated, um, but it's about 2.82 by 1.6 centimeters in a castrated male dog. Um, so it's big, which is definitely not normal. Um, and his sublumbar lymph node was almost four centimeters. Um, so that's a pretty big sublumbar lymph node and explains his clinical signs. So we did do a prostatic wash. This is before the days of BRAF testing, because BRAF testing can also detect prostate carcinomas. So it can tell us if there's a carcinoma there or not, transitional cell versus prostate, but um, it can be diagnostic. And here you can see that we have cells that are super abnormal. So some of these are really little, some of these are giant with huge multiple nucleoli, lots of criteria of malignancy in these, and it, it was enough for us to diagnose a prostate carcinoma. So prostate carcinomas are treated in a very similar manner to transitional cell carcinomas, and that's for two reasons. One, we think a lot of the prostate cancers in dogs that we see are actually transitional cell carcinomas of the urethra that invaded into the prostate. And we can't, in many cases, we don't just don't know if it's primary prostate versus primary urethra. Um, and two, and very minimal and sparse as far as data that we have and supports how we, we treat these tumors. And so surgery has been studied for prostate tumors, a complete prostatectomy or partial. The problem is that regardless if it's transitional cell of the urethra or primary of the prostate, tumor is super invasive, so we're not gonna get it all out. If you do a complete resection, it's gonna grow back before recovery, similarly, similar with partial. Um, and many dogs after complete prostatectomy are, are incontinent. Um, so that's a client quality of life issue. We can use radiation therapy in the prostate. It's relatively easy to target using CT-guided radiation. We do recommend non-steroidals. Um, and again, we like to start with paroxicam. Or we can use urethral stents. It doesn't treat the primary tumor itself, but it does open up and expand the urethra so that they can urinate and be comfortable while we move forward with more aggressive therapies. And we tend to start with mitoxantrone or carboplatin. I mean, this is a, a picture of a linear accelerator for the radiation side of things. Um, to treat prostate cancer. The prognosis for the prostates is not as good as what it is for transitional cell carcinomas of the bladder, and that's twofold. One, without getting local disease control in the urethra, we end up losing them to urethral obstruction and decline in quality of life. Um, and two, they tend to metastasize faster than the transitional cell carcinomas of the bladder there. So I think um, some really important real quick, and I recognize that I'm running out of time, um, but some real quick tidbits on differentiating prostate infection versus cancer. Part of that is gonna be historical. So is the dog intact or castrated? And if castrated, when? So if the dog was castrated young and it's an older pet, then an enlarged and irregular prostate is pretty suspicious for cancer. And if it's mineralized, it's almost a slam dunk for cancer. If the dog is intact or more recently castrated, chronic prostatitis can also cause an irregular mineralized prostate. Um, and so then we're gonna be a bit more aggressive in diagnostics and perhaps not so convinced of cancer right away. And I think right there, um, what, what do you think, Andy? Maybe a good place for us to stop so I can take more questions? I think that is a great place to stop. Um, Questions, uh, the, the big ones that, that I saw that came in uh, as we went along, would you be willing to speak a little bit to, um, to NSAIDs as far as, I know a lot of us have, uh, you know, there's the more popular NSAIDs on our shelves. So specifically people asked about um, the like Galaprant, Meloxicam, stuff like that. Do those have benefits? Um, is, um, you know, if they don't, tolerate other NSAIDs well. I, I think I'd like your sort of candid candid input on knowing what I have on the shelf. Uh, is, is there utility in that or do I need to stay away from it? Sure. Uh, great questions. So for meloxicam, because it is a, a true non-steroidal, um, I will pull that one out if it's well tolerated. And the ones that so I, I try to start with the ones that have been studied. Um, so paroxicam, ferococcib, diracoxib are, are those that have been studied for the bladder carcinomas. But meloxicam is also a good selective COX-2 inhibitor. Galaprant, I don't know. Um, and so because I don't have any information as to whether or not it might be effective in cancer, um, I generally won't pull it out for the treatment of cancer. If my patient needs non-steroidals for other reasons like 
arthritis in our older patients and they are not tolerating the ones that we like to use for cancer treatment, then by all means, I use Galaprin for a quality of life for other reasons. But it's not one I'll pull out for cancer treatment because I don't know yet if it's effective. Awesome. Well, guys, um, if anyone has any final questions, now's the time. I'll put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. We've got about five minutes left. For everybody else, the link is now in the chat box. Um, please fill out that, uh, hit that link, and that is where you will fill out the information to get your CE certificate. Uh, we do need to get some information from you in order to generate it now. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, I hate to ask you to, to fill it out, but it's the only way we can get you your CE these days. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. CE certificates will be coming next week, uh, which is a little bit of a turnaround time. And, uh, and so you guys can expect that. Uh, we've got a, a comment that says, I had a case in which meloxicam was used with a survival time of almost two years. So that was wonderful. Dr. Bechtel, thank you. The comments in the, uh, in the chat uh, were just wonderful. And um, I will send some along to you uh, for you to see uh, just because they'll brighten your weekend. Uh, guys, you guys are amazing. Thank you to Cruz for making this possible. We could not have done it without him. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bechtel. Any, um, any parting words from you? Uh, any uh, place that people can follow you or uh, read your uh, research or anything like that that you'd like to put out? Um, I don't. So the University of Florida Small Animal Hospital website and um, the Small Animal Clinical Sciences has a little bit of a tidbit on my research. But honestly, the best way, if you have any questions to get a hold of me, is just go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is available um, at the UF website. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Everyone, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks again to Cruz for being here. Um, uh, oh, quick question on explain how, uh, how to get CE. You're going to click the link that is up above uh, it, that says CE link, and it just dropped in again. Uh, click on that, fill out your information, and we will email you that link. So uh, that, that should take care of everything. Uh, Jamie Holmes, is there anything that I'm forgetting as far as the logistics? Nope, we're good to go. Guys, have a wonderful rest of your Friday and a great, great weekend. Thank you again, Dr. Bechtel, for being here. It was really fantastic. Great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Have a great weekend.